interest does any recordings back? Are they of any use at all? Yes. Uh -huh. I watch one of them. <laughs> you watch them, but for no use. <laughs> yes. Yes. I do love them. I enjoy them. Sometimes I play them on in the car if I'm driving for a bit. That's actually a good idea to take the video, oh. uh, to take the sound and just listen. Yeah, to just it. listen to the sound. <laughs> yeah. What you can do is play it as you're going to sleep. I'm sure if anything's going to get you to sleep in these strange times, it's listening yeah. to me drone on about governance, risk, and compliance. That would be irritating. My wife wouldn't l like to listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just an extra bonus. Irritating lives is what we live for. <laughs> it will send me. It will send me to the next room. Okay. Um, so first things first. Any questions from last week? Actually, from the last two weeks, because what we've kind of finished now is the governance part. Uh, so is there anything from that that's occurred to you since last week? Nothing that I can think of just now. Mm, not from the top of my head, sir. OK. So, because I know that there's new people here, I'm going to say it again. Although I think the new people aren't actually here, looking at the names on my screen. Um, what you should be doing is starting your final report now. You should be getting it all. Uh, so all the stuff that we are covering, you should be doing that on the case study so that it's all ready to put together at the end. So you should be well on the way to having your governance section of the report done. One thing that we missed from governance, again, because I droned on, was this small presentation. Um, I spoke when we were talking about governance about this idea that um, it's about improvement. It's about deciding what you want your organization to be, or even your small part of the organization. We currently get one uh, GOS attack a month. Well, can we make it one every two months or once every quarter? It's about looking at where you are, figuring out what the next step is and trying to progress there. And th there's lots of different techniques and you'll see lots of different acronyms, but they're all basically trying to do the same thing. It's about trying to make a plan of where you want to be figuring out the actions required and doing them, checking whether they have worked and acting uh, for that. And it's this process. So the diagram stop. It says plan, do, check, act, and then back into your next plan to continue the next phase of your evolution, because if a, an organization isn't continually getting better, then you simply have to look around to see all the other organizations which are. So simply by standing still, you fall behind. So it's important for an organization or even just the part of the organization for which you're responsible continues its, its uh, I'm trying desperately not to say journey because I hate that phrase, but use its way to getting better. You don't know how you're going to do that if you don't know what it is you're trying to do. If I wanted to go to Kilwinning, I know how to get there. It's close. I get in my car. I'll be there in five minutes. If I want to go to Cumbernauld, I'm going to have to look up a map. I'm going to have to make a plan of how to get there. Um, when we were talking about it, Matthew, I did that. I was going to put it up on the screen. I was going to give a whole big example about how I was going to check how to get to Cumbernauld and the map would show me the route to get there. But actually, when I tried it, what Google Maps said was, you really don't want to do this. 
So I, I stopped there. Nothing from Matthew. See, this is a problem. In a class, I might get, you know, a half smile or a, a finger sorry, or something. Sorry, I was I, I, I muted on the headset, just not on Teams. Yep, I agree. Every time I consider going up to see my mates, I go, nah, let's go to Glasgow. So you need a plan, and then you need to carry it out. There's no point in making a plan if you don't actually do the stuff. And you also don't know um, whether you've got there. So you need to carry out the plan and see whether you've got there. And it shouldn't be, oh, I am going to leave Ardrossan and go to Cumbernauld. Well, yeah, but that's quite a big leap. For a start, how am I getting there? Am I driving? Am I taking public transport? If I'm taking public transport, uh, what do I need to do? I need to get a bus and then a train and then I need to go from one train station to another and get a different train and then finally get a bus at my other end. So there's a whole series of steps in there which all not have to be thought about, but not just have to be thought about, but they have to be synchronised. There's no point in me getting the bus now if I find out that the next train isn't for another hour. I'd be better waiting for the next bus. There's no point in me getting a train at 11 o'clock if I find out that I can't then transfer to another train at Cumbernauld because I've stopped for the night and I'm sitting at Queen Street for eight hours. So it's about not just the final destination, but all the steps along the way. And if you make a small step, it's actually easier to figure out whether you're getting it right. I'm taking public transport, so I'm going to get the bus. But my train's in 10 minutes and I can't get the bus. But I'm only five minutes from the station, so if I phone a taxi, I could maybe get there in time. So that small step, if I know that it's not going to work, I can change so that my final outcome, getting to Cumbernauld, stays the same. And I do it in the same time frame as well. Whereas if I miss that first step, everything goes out of whack. I miss my first train which means I miss my connection, which means I miss my bus at Cumbernauld, which means I miss my meeting. So starting with the small steps and checking that they're working is really good sense. Sometimes, of course, you don't actually know what the best thing is. What if you are, what if you're in your organisation and you're going to update your system? What's the plan for that? Do you go all in on a new system? Just say, right, midnight tonight, done. As of tomorrow, you're on this new system, good luck. Or do you perhaps engage people with what's going to be done? Test out different systems? Do you get people in to say, now we're thinking of this, have a play with it and tell me what you think. Do you get in multiple systems and say, play with this one, play with this one, and play with this one, and see which one you think is right? Lots of online stuff does that all the time because it's really easy to do something called A-B testing. If you go to a website, you might see something different from the person that sits beside you because what they do is they take different people and basically test. Amazon will change their front page to see if that change will get more clicks, but they don't change it for everybody. They select 10% of the people that come and see if that gives them enough to make that change for everybody. And if it doesn't, they move back. Little lost. So the plan can't be a big, oh yes, yeah, big bang do it. Oven ready deal. It'll be ready in nine months. No problem. We don't need to worry about the detail. It has to be thought through and each step has to hang together. And the only way you know if they hang together, the only way that you know if you're actually going to get something done is to check it. I'm going to Cumbernauld. OK, so I'm going to go to Kilmarnock and then I'm going to catch the motorway to Glasgow and then I'm going to go through Glasgow 
I'll go and catch a different motorway up. And now my geography is kicking in up Stirling Way, which is also Cumbernauld Way. You know, whatever. But if I find out that in that first step, I haven't got to Kilmarnock, I've started heading south and getting to here, I might want to think whether I've been going the right way or not. So you check your current situation. If it's not where you expect it to be, change. Rethink your plan. Don't sit there going, yes, it'll be all right. We just have to keep going and things will be fine in the end. Because if I leave where I am and head down to here, eventually I'll end up falling into the English Channel if I just keep going. You need to stop, check and make sure you're getting to the right place. Are the changes I've made to my DDoS plan working? Have I moved from one per month to two per month? Or actually, have I opened myself up and I'm now getting more attacks than I ever did? You need to check where you are, see what's happening and make sure it's what you expected. And that's important as well. What did you expect? What was the outcome that you wanted? Uh, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but if you have any programming experience, you don't create a program and then run it and see what it outputs. You create it knowing what the output is. Only what the output is, do you run the program and see whether or not it works. And it's the same with these kinds of plans. You don't put in a new DDoS system, see what happens and say, oh yeah, that's what I expected to begin with. You have to decide what your expected outcome is. And then. Check to see whether your plan is moving you towards that. You can then start making. Changes. The better, but if not, you've been checking along the way so you can roll them back. And you can reevaluate what it is you're actually expecting to do. As you get further into this, sometimes the acronym changes and it's not ACT, because ACT is usually the first time through, but it's adjust. So we've done this, we'll adjust it and we'll do something different. But again, the point is it's a continuous process. So you don't do it once, you keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. And if you're ever lucky enough to get to the solved part, you're doing really well because most organisations, it's a continued uh, change and check. So you have to keep going. You have to continually improve and decide what is acceptable. Wonderful, you've got your DDoS down to once a quarter. But that means that once a quarter, your whole organization has lost, for example, its website. Now, if you are uh, Fred's Rag and Bone Shop, your website going down for a day probably doesn't matter that much. If you are Amazon and your website goes down for a day, that's quite a big thing. So you have to decide. What is your level? What is enough? What is your aim? And that has to be continually reevaluated. And whatever your previous target was becomes where you are now. So how am I going to then move on from that? And it gets harder. You're continually going up this improvement uh, slope to try and make your organization better. So as I say, there are different um, ways of approaching it. So PDCA is one of them. You'll see plenty of them if any of you have got to the library or looked at some electronic books or anything online, you'll see different ways of doing it. There are different techniques. 
Uh, and another technique that's used is something called the five whys. It's about trying to understand why things happened. I am expecting a delivery that didn't come. Why? Because the van broke down. Do you stop at that point? Do you just go, yeah, van broke down, happy with that, move on? No, you asked why the van broke down. Good question. The van broke down because the uh, timing belt snapped. We're happy with that? No. You're on mute, Emmanuel. Still on mute, Emmanuel. I'm on. There you go. Why would the timing belt snap? Good question. Why would the timing belt snap? Isn't a timing belt the sort of thing that is uh, part of the continued uh, maintenance of a vehicle? Yep, service plan of the vehicle. <laughs> so was the vehicle not maintained? Mm. Why not? So you continue on asking why until you get to the Conclusion, I didn't get my delivery because we didn't have a proper maintenance plan in place for our vehicles. Everything else that happened, the timing belt snapping, the van breaking down, that was all a consequence. Mm. So you have to, pardon? No, I'm agreeing to what you're saying. Yeah, that's true. So you have to ask why. You have to continually ask why until you get to the actual starting point of why something went wrong. It's called five whys simply because that is roughly how many times you need to ask why to get to the root cause. It might be more, it might be less. There's also the possibility that the root cause might have other contributing factors. Yes, we didn't put a maintenance in place for the vehicle because we don't have the money to do that. Why not? And so on and so on. Mm. The point is you keep asking why until you get to that root cause. And if the root cause is we didn't have the process in place to put that maintenance for our vehicles in place, then we need to go back to our PDCA. Well, what's our plan? We need to get maintenance in place. What do we need to do? Implement the schedules. Check. Are the vehicles still breaking down for that reason? Not because you ran over a, a nail and you got a and you got a tire blown. You can't expect you can't expect maintenance to sort that. But if it was because the tire blew because the tires aren't being replaced often enough, then you might have to adjust your maintenance schedule to say, well, actually, if the vans are doing this many miles, we need to replace the tires every nine months rather than every 11 months. So you yeah, adjust your schedule. So there's lots of different ways of do doing this, and it's important to get everyone's input from top to bottom. And it's also better to do these sorts of things in person with no comeback. You can't do this kind of thing if someone thinks that by saying something, they will be uh, put on a wee list somewhere as somebody that's being difficult. So you get people together, you get a big bit of pay or a whiteboard or something, and you start asking people what's been going wrong. Always trying to reach the next step. Our van broke down. Why? Because the timing belt broke, and therefore the timing belt wasn't replaced in time. Why? because we didn't have a proper implementation, a proper maintenance plan. And therefore, so you go through this recycle just to try and make 
your way towards the root cause. And it's important to do it step by step. It's also important never to say, well, it's because Fred didn't do his job properly. If Fred didn't do his job properly, who was checking? Where was the bit of paper that said, yeah, here's the schedule for the van that Fred was supposed to maintain? Where's the bit of paper that says it was done? Where's the bit of paper that said, here's the schedule and this is how often it needs to be done? It's not quite as simple as saying, well, Fred didn't do it. Was Fred know he was to do it? Who was checking that Fred was doing it? So all of these uh, things come under control that we'll be talking about later. So I said to you it's governance, risk and compliance, but some people like to add control as well. So how often we maintain our vans is entirely up to us. There's no legislation other than the usual stuff in terms of MOT and keeping a van safe. The legislation doesn't apply. There's nothing in legislation that says how often we have to replace our timing belt. But our internal controls might say, yeah, well, actually, this is quite a big part of our business and we need to do something about it. And one of the key things to think about is this isn't. This should be thought about not just from the company's point of view, but more importantly, from the user of your service. And depending on the organisation, that may be a customer or, or anything at all. So any questions about that? Nope. No. Nope. I'm happy. OK, in that case, what I want to move on to. Is. Bearing that PDCA thing in mind, I want to start talking about risk. Our van broke down, that's a risk to our company, because if our customers don't get the goods that they've ordered, they'll be upset. And if they're up, they might not come back again. Risk is very simply trying to think about our organisation, think about the issues that may occur, writing them down and trying to figure out in advance what we would do if it did. DDOS is a potential problem. So what's your plan to deal with it if it happens? And if you don't have a plan to deal with it, why not? Do you want to wait until something happens before you do it? That doesn't seem a reasonable way to work. So risk is about trying to understand the issues within your organisation and how you may address them. And we'll talk about different ways of addressing them in the lecture. So we're talking about risk management here. We're talking about um, what we do for risk and everyone takes a risk. Some people live in co-winning, that's a risk every single day. But they do it anyway. Everyone takes risks. Driving is a risk. These days, going to the supermarket is a risk. Organisations aren't any different. They all take risks. The question is what you do to minimise the potential problematical outcomes. We all have to go to the supermarket because we need to eat. But we take precautions. We wash our hands and wipe down trolleys and use hand gel and wear masks. The risk exists, 
but we do our best to minimise it. And that's the core of risk management. We need to identify what the risks are and we need to manage them. Everyone takes risks. Four years ago, there were 181,384 road traffic accidents. 1,792 people died. Have we stopped people driving, cycling, walking? If not, why not? It's the single biggest cause of death in our young people. And by young, I talk about MD under 30. So we know the risks there. Why don't we just take it away? Because there's other things we can do with risk. We can avoid it. So we can take the, the student course. We can avoid risks by staying in bed all day. Not everybody has that uh, ability. We can avoid the risk of COVID by not leaving the house. Not everyone can do that. So we can avoid the roads, but that is probably not practical for most of us. So we can educate people about using the roads well. Uh, some of you will remember some of those um, campaigns that are on there. When I was we, I was a member of the Tufty Club, and Tufty taught me how to cross the road safely. And there's been more. There's the Green Cross Code Man. There's look left, look right. There are all these different types of education. To try and teach people how to use roads correctly. So here, for example, is a public information film from 45 years ago when Brian was young. Close enough. So we don't tell kids to not leave the house. We try and teach them how to cross the road safely. Anybody want to um, to know the connection between that film and Star Wars? Does it know that guy, uh, David Prowse? Was he know? Something to do with it. I can't remember. Wasn't it like Chewbacca or something? I can't remember the guy's name. You're on the right lines. Uh, no. I would say it was David Prowse, wasn't it? Has something to do with it? Who was the actual suit actor for Darth Vader? And obviously they replaced, they replaced the voice with James Earl Jones. Uh, Darth Vader. That's the one. 
And then he was raging, and, and he was raging, and then he realised that he wasn't the voice until we went to the cinema to see it. <laughs> well, I think he might have had a fair idea because even when he was a Green Cross code man, that's not his voice. No, <laughs> Bristol. He talks like a country bumpkin. <laughs> you couldn't have Darth Vader come around. I, I will. I am your father. Look, oh yeah. Oh, I'd love to have that seen the original. Possibly footage. the worst impersonation I've ever done in my life. Anyway, the point is, we educate kids to cross the road safely. <clears throat> we accept that there's a risk. We know that there's a risk, but we try and educate them to um, cross the road as safely as they possibly can. So, if we have risk, if we know that risk exists, if we've identified what it is, what are we going to do about it? And this applies for an organisation as well as individuals. So our management of road traffic accidents is to try and educate. So again, with PDCA, you'll see different ways of approaching risk. I'm going to concentrate on those five things in the second column because they're a reasonable approach. Um, you'll see them repeated in lots of places, but you'll also see other approaches taken. They are not wrong. They're simply different ways of doing it. So I'm going to look at those five things. So for example, you might just accept the risk. You might just say, yep, it might happen, but that's fine. I know that there are 182,000 road traffic accidents a year, but I'm still going to cross the road. I'll take the risk. It's a small risk, so I'm quite happy with it. Small, of course, is a movable feast, and you have to decide what small means in terms of what you're doing, or more importantly, what your organisation's doing. What is small? Is it won't take long? So is it a small amount of time? Is it won't cost much? It's a small amount of money. You could put an RF every or a shop sale, get up a, 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 a detection system at the exit that will beep whenever you walk out with one of those things. But if an RFID tag costs 20 pence and you're putting them on every curly whirly, the economics don't stack up. So where in that spectrum of how much something costs, are you ex do you accept the risk? There's also the balance of effect. You could have people wandering about a shop, following people, staring at them, daring them to steal something. But if somebody did that to me in a shop, I wouldn't be going there very often. So it would have a different effect that I was expecting. So it could be that you accept a risk when it's small. But actually, we accept risks that are huge. Every so often you'll see a thing in the papers or on the TV and it'll talk about um, asteroids coming close to the Earth. Well, if it happens to hit, we're in trouble. And if you don't believe me, just ask the dinosaurs. But on the other hand, what can we usefully do about an asteroid hitting us? And the answer is, not an awful lot, although that may depend. The lad on the right has taken asteroid avoidance measures. They're not going to help. But if you work in the International Space Station, you actually have models of where things might hit you, what might happen, and what the uh, risk might be if they happen. 
So for example, if those are your impact risks, you might decide that you want your living quarters to be in there, in that, that nice blue bit, rather than sticking them up on that big red bit on the edge. So that at least if it hits, what you lose is an experiment rather than life. So you accept it and you decide what you're going to do. OK, so with that introduction, what I'm going to do. Is. Take a wee break. Like I said, it's we struggle online. It's very tiring. So I'm doing my best to remember to take breaks. I do sometimes forget and I apologize for that. But I think what we'll do right now is just take a wee 10 minute break. Seeing as how Brian never made me a cup of tea, I'll maybe go and stick the kettle on or I might just stand up and take a wee walk. But let's take a break and um, come back in. 10 minutes. No problem. Thank you very much. Right. We'll see you soon. See, see you. Soon.
OK. I'm back. Or at least I am. Any signs of life out there? Yep. Hello. Yep. Hi. Yeah. Yes. Good. Just ignore me. As soon as how Brian wouldn't get me tea, I had to go and get it myself. Yeah, I did send it, but I just. Uh... It's okay. Take, I'll remember. I remember your lack of charity. I'm even having a biscuit. I had some Halloween gums and a couple of Percy pigs. I don't know if you've had them. It's like Marks and Spencers kind of. Mm -hmm. Marks and Spencers. Meat, meat free gums. They're, they're just dead nice. Just get, get them in. That's my treat. Fancy. Uh, I only go to Marks and Spencers at like quarter to nine when they're, they're priced everything down. Don't go there during the day. <laughs> Fast all the time I go to a shop, quarter to shutting time. I get what I need and then I'm out. It's actually better getting into places when it's stone dead. One of the things I found during lockdown was my local supermarket around about half the four was dead, so I could just get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And it was also when they were starting to put on the yellow stickers, which was a bonus. Aye, I like that. I like a wee bargain. OK, so we were talking about risk. We were talking about different ways there's no point in me pointing to something on my screen. I kind of need to do the rules, don't I? Yeah. We're talking about different ways of approaching it. And we thought about accepting it. And the next one we want to talk about is avoiding it. Most people don't take a risk if they don't have to. Why would you? Sometimes you do have to take that risk. Sometimes you do have to cross that road. <clears throat> if you don't have to take the risk, why put yourself in that position? Most of you will be aware that organisations tend to have uh, financial years that go from April to April. If you're an organisation that has financial staff who have to create the uh, year-end figures and do all of the number crunching. Why would you send them in holiday in March, just as you're getting to the point where you need to do all these things? And of course, the simple answer is you wouldn't. You avoid that risk. You tell them not to take that time. Sorry, we're just too busy. You can't have a holiday. All of Brian's pals and Marks and Spencers, good luck getting a holiday in December towards Christmas, the traditional busy period. It simply wouldn't happen. So you avoid risk where you can. You take the opportunity to not Excuse me. You take the opportunity to not let that risk appear. If you can't do that, you might want to try and send that risk elsewhere. How about if you can't accept the risk and you can't avoid the risk, you transfer? I don't want to take the risk that my house burns down. I can't avoid it because I've got a house. So how about I transfer that? How about I pay someone to take that risk for me? And I give them some money every year so that if anything happens to my house, they've taken the risk. And of course that only works because there are lots of people in that position. So hundreds of thousands of people put in some money. Hundreds of people have the risk uh, happen to them. 
but from the hundreds of thousands of people who have put in the money, we can pay off the hundreds of people that have been affected. So we can transfer the risk. And we think of it as the company to whom we're transferring the risk, but actually we're transferring it to all of the other people or organisations who are also transferring that risk. The money doesn't come from the or from the insurance company as such. It comes from the other people who have also paid into that pot. So we can transfer the risk. We know how much it would be to rebuild the house and repay things, so we can set numbers against it. And that's actually a, someone's job to try and figure out what the possibility is that your house will burn down and how much it will cost to rebuild. And from that, they can set a number against how much it will cost you to insure it. Some risks, though, can't be so easily quantified. So you could, for example, insure against your uh, software project or your hardware project not completing in time. But how do you quantify that risk? Some bits are OK. We had 10 contractors making £200 a day working for five months who bought £50,000 worth of hardware. So there's a monetary cost for sure, but there are other costs. Presumably they are doing that for a reason. If the project fails, what is the cost to your organisation of not having that new service or the new piece of software or the hardware properly implemented? What would have been the cost to an organisation uh, 20 years ago? if the money that they'd invested in changing their systems to cope with the year 2000 hadn't worked. It's not just the cost of the contractors who had to create those systems. It was the cost of all the missed orders, all the missed deliveries, all the missed, well, whatever your organization's about because your systems couldn't cope with it anymore. How do you put a cost on that and how do you get a proper payback if actually the outcome is your organisation stops? So you can transfer risk, but quantifying that transfer can be difficult. What you can also do is try and mitigate the risk. So instead of saying, I'm going to insure against my server failing. And if it fails, I want £10,000 a day to cover my risk. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but actually, don't wouldn't you rather have your server back up? So we can mitigate risk by trying to minimise any loss. So instead of saying, I just want money if my server fails, what about saying, I want my server replaced. And there might be different tiers of cost involved in that. So you might decide it's so important to me that my server does not fail, that instead of buying one, I will buy two, and I'll keep the other one going all the time. And if anything happens to it, I'll swap to my backup server, which has all the same data, all the same connections and everything else. It's clearly very expensive. But if you're in that kind of area, that's what you have to do. If you're BT, for example, with your mainframe, you keep another mainframe at a different place. That mainframe that's taken note of all the calls and all the connections and where you're calling and how much they're costing and how much that's going to be on your account. If you lose that for even an hour, you lose a fortune, 
but you also lose quite a lot of public face. Because no one signs up for a phone company that can actually make a call. So you might have a replacement server, just a complete backup all there ready to go. Or say, for example, you have an office in Glasgow. You might get together with 20 other similar companies and say, look, we're all using the same type of equipment. How about we get together and we buy a 20th of a server and we have that sitting there ready to go in case any of us have an issue? So instead of having an on-site server, you have an off-site server, one that's ready to go in. It'll take longer because it has to get there and it has to be replaced and you have to connect it all up and all the rest of the stuff. But you'll still get back fairly quickly, but it will be a lot cheaper than having a replacement server on site. And as I say, you might do that amongst different companies or you might actually contract a third party to do that and say, look, if you have, if I have a, a failure, you will respond to me in a set time. And that's exactly what happens. You have set response times. And if somebody needs something fixed within a week, that's an awful lot cheaper than if they want it fixed within a day, which is a lot cheaper than if they want it fixed within an hour. So you pay your money and you take your chance. Because all you might say is, well, rather than having anything, let's have a spare power supply or a spare hard disk. And if they fail, I'll swap them out. You have to decide what the correct level of mitigation is for all aspects of what you do. If your firewall hardware fails, do you continue running your systems and take the chance? If your accounting systems fail, what will happen to your organization? And if they've failed because of a security breach, what will happen to your job, given that that's what you're there to do? So you have to identify these, figure out what the possible consequences might be, decide how you're going to address those, and also make it clear what the cost of that will be. Stop me if I've told this story before because, but it's a, an illustration of how it can happen. This is such an important thing, and I mentioned BT, but the same issue arises if you're a bank. You need your IT to continue. It was such an important thing that there was a company who in essence, supplied two computers in one box. They were called Tandem. And instead of buying a computer, you bought a Tandem computer, which had two of everything. Two CPUs, two I.O., two everything. The idea being that if something happens, you don't get much quicker than falling over to the next uh, computer that's in literally in the same box. Expensive, because you're duplicating every piece of hardware. You're having to put in software to make things happen. But if you're a bank that can't afford to lose transactions, absolutely worth it. Which made it quite embarrassing when went down. And it went down for the best part of a day and a half, despite their tandem computer. So not surprisingly, there was a wee bit of an inquest into what happened. And nobody could understand it. The computer had failed. It hadn't gone over to the backup computer. And actually, it turned out that the backup computer wasn't working. It took a long time to go through all the logs. But what they found was, within the first five minutes of starting up 
that box the backup had failed. Literally gone bang. The power supply had gone and it was dead. And actually, it had reported that. It said, look, we're, we're dead here. You need to fix this now, please. But because it was in the first five minutes, it was when lost in a whole pile of information and log transactions because it was just another one of the things as the stuff was booting up. So they turned it on. It had run, I think from memory, for about two and a half years with only one box and no one was aware that they didn't actually have a backup in place. You have to find a balance. You have to understand your risk. And one of the changes that was made to that system after that happened was a very simple one. If something fails, you don't give one report. You say, I have failed. And then you say the same thing again five minutes later. And if you don't get any response to that, you say something again four minutes later, then three minutes, then two minutes, then one minute, until eventually the only thing that that computer will tell you is, I have failed and you need to do something. Because if that had been in place right from the start, that wouldn't have happened because they would have continually got messages that they had an error because it's easy to miss something. Mitigation has got to be about understanding the issues, understanding the potential problems and deciding where you stand in that calculation. What's the cost of mitigating something against the cost of the failure? And that calculation will very much depend on your knowledge. So you have to understand these systems, have to understand what will happen, not just in your case about IT, but about the rest of the organisation. Your risk management might say, my server might fail and it will cost me £10,000 to replace. That's not good enough. Yes, of course it does. But what happens while you're replacing that server? What happens to the rest of the organization? How much is it costing them? What's happening to orders? What's happening to reputation? What's happening to all those people that are sitting there unable to work because your server has failed? So it's not just about understanding the IT, it's about understanding the IT in the wider sense of the organisation. Never forget that IT is a service. If the organisation didn't exist, you wouldn't need the IT. So it's important for the sort of thing that you'll be going into, that you understand that in its wider sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. OK. OK, so that is mitigation. We could, of course, exploit risks. We could say. This is going to happen. We know it's going to happen, so therefore let's make it happen. It's the only way we get new drugs. People searching for a, a COVID vaccination. How do you know if it works? How do you know that injecting the new concoction won't just kill you immediately? Because there's a chance. So any new drug has to be tried. Someone has to take it. Someone's got to be the first. So sometimes when you have a risk, there's nothing you can do about it. Why not make it happen? So in the case of a drug, you give it to someone. You give it to someone in controlled circumstances. So if anything happens, they have the best care and you can do something about it. You don't just you know, randomly post it to a few people and see what happens. You exploit the risk. You make the risk one. 100% chance of this happening by doing it, but closely observing 
what happens and what you're going to do. So in the case of a drug, you can keep the ones that work and dump the ones that don't. So if we have these things, if we have everything in the organisation that could cause a problem, if we have an idea of the problems that it could cause, how we might go about avoiding them or mitigating them or ensuring against them of any of the other things, what we need in our organisation is some sort of plan. Something that says, yeah, we've thought about this and here's what happens. We have thought about a DDoS attack and here's our plan. We've thought about the server failing. Here's our plan. We've thought about our single person who knows about uh, running our server falling under a bus. And here's our plan. Every organisation will have a plan. And it'll have plans in all sorts of areas as well. So, for example, here's a treasury management and investment strategy. So it's another public public uh, document. So this council clearly has money. They handle money every day, whether it's council tax that they get in or money from the government or money that they're paying out or investments that they keep or bank accounts that they have. They have to have a strategy for it. And part of that strategy on page 24 register. Well, they've thought about all this stuff. And up on page 24. I can get to it. They have a risk register. Where they have identified a risk. Right to text. Is that better? Does that highlight better? Can you see it? Not much, no. All right, you talk about the wee dot thing. Aye, right, it's, it's fine. They have identified risks which I'm not even going to pretend to understand because I'm not a finance person. I don't know what the risk of failure by a counterparty to meet its contractual obligations to the organisation, particularly due to the counterparty's diminished credit worthiness, might mean. But I'm sure accountants do, and it means something to them. I do understand what the consequence is. We don't get the money back. And there's also a thing in there that says how we're going to control that. In this particular case, minimum credit criteria. So just like people, organisations have a credit worthiness. How likely are they to repay? Them? So instead of as many councils did, I can't even remember, was it a decade ago? Where they put money into 15 years ago, they put money into the Icelandic banks because of a promised a high rate of return, which they were right up until the banks went bust and they didn't get a penny. There was no protection. The investment funds were not returned, neither in full nor in part. So this is a big thing now that they have to check their investment strategy. Basically, where do I keep my money to make sure that if something goes wrong, I don't lose it? For us, there are 
inbuilt things. I, I can't remember what the numbers are, but if you're lucky enough to have up to £85,000, I think it is, in a bank, it's protected. Matthew, are you going to say something there? No, no. Oh, you're flashing away. It's as if you were trying to say oh, something. So I, I was moving my, my mixer, so I think my wire may have like sparked or something. You were moving your mixer. That's yeah. just showing off. Not really. It's just I have wires showing up. But it's just to, to have two sources of audio on the one because I don't like speakers. So we have this possibility that the council could have a bank account and everyone puts their credit, uh, their council tax in there. It's got a million pounds and the bank goes bust and you don't get the money back. So instead of putting it into the brand new Bank of Zimbabwe, you put it into a bank that you might have some faith in. And the final one there is a status RAG. Anyone want to guess what RAG stands for? Particularly there's a hint on the screen. Risk assessment something. No. Think traffic lights. Or red, amber, green. So it's how likely is this risk? So for this particular one, it's an amber one. Basically because there's not an awful lot you can do about it. You need to have your money somewhere. But if we have another issue like we had in 2008, there's very little they can do about it. There are liquidity risks. Do you have enough money in your wallet to go and buy things? That's green because they reckon that they have worked out the finances well enough. So it goes through, and remember this is only financial risks. It goes through looking at the finance risks, saying what they are, saying what could happen, what they have in place to make sure that it doesn't happen at the moment, and how likely it is. So this is our risk management plan. And as well as having the plan, they have controls, things that they're not going to do. So if you think that you have money in a bank and the bank might not give you it back, let's make sure that we don't put too much money into each bank. So here they've said no more than 10 million pounds. Still a lot of money, but survivable. So they're saying not just what the risks are, what the possible consequences might be, but the mitigating controls that they're doing to make sure that they minimise the risk and minimise the potential uh, bad outcomes from those risks. So that's a finance one. I can show you other types. Here's a strategic risk report. Uh, the risk is that continued austerity will require the council to take increasingly difficult and challenging decisions. Basically, they won't have enough money to build houses or pay the teachers or fill in the holes in the road. They've identified that risk, they've said what it was, and they've used, so they've said what the risk is, they've said what the consequences may be, and said what controls are in place to ensure that that doesn't happen. Basically, we look at the budget all the time. So it's the same kind of idea. We have type, description, control, it's just shown in a different way. So here, all of that. So the description, the consequence, the control and the rag status. Here we have controls. And in this one, they're all put into one. Place the risk, the consequence, the control. 
and they, in this case, have used a risk matrix. So what they've done is they've assessed the impact from one to five. They've assessed the likelihood from one to five. And they've said, look, the likelihood of this happening, the likelihood of us getting less money is pretty much certain. So it's right up at the top. We can do things, so we can cut services, we can stop filling in the potholes, we can do all sorts of things. They're not good things, but they can happen. So the impact will be four out of five. Giving you a five times four risk score of 20. So it's the same idea, but it's presented in a slightly different way. And if we go down this document, the same thing is happening. Children will experience poverty, uh, which means there'll be increased levels of deprivation, reduced health and well-being. What's the likelihood? What's the impact? Uh, financial stability of the health and social care partnership. In this case, it's still 20, but it's a slightly different 20. The likelihood is four out of five. Emmanuel, you can tell us about this. That looked like an NHS tag on your shirt. But it's up to the health board, in this case, the integrated joint board, to ensure yes. <laughs> that they're financially stable. The likelihood, likelihood of them becoming non-financially stable is four out of five. I'm guessing most of it is for all those computers that are stacked behind the manual, but that's just my guess. I don't know. Yes, they are. The impact of the NHS not having enough money, well, that's five out of five. People don't get admitted to hospital. People don't get tests. People don't get treated. That's a big impact. Mm. So it's still 20, but in a slightly different way. OK, so it goes through identifying the risks, explaining the consequences, saying what's being done to stop that happening. And giving a visual. And a numerical value for all of these things. So we have a risk management plan. All the risks, all the mitigations, everything in place. And in fact, you can go further. You can say not just what it is. So you've seen some of these things. You might want to categorize it. And again, we've seen that. So some of them are financial, some of them are wider risks. They've used a probability 25, 0.25. You had a score out of 25, 5 times 5 doesn't matter as long as you've decided what it is and everybody understands it. Estimated impact. How much time? So this is a risk register for. Uh, in this case, I think a, a software project, but it could be a hardware project or it could be anything else. What happens? Scope creep is. Does that phrase mean scope creep? No idea. Anyone? It refers to projects which grow arms and legs. If we're doing this, why don't we do this as well? And if we're doing that, why don't we do that? Why don't we also do this? So the scope of the project increases and increases and increases and increases. Because people want more, so there's a one in four chance of that happening. It will cost this amount, it will take that amount of time. And they've planned for it, they've said this is what we're going to do, and this is actually how much it's going to cost to do that. Do you, what have you, do you work out 
think how much it's going to cost with that kind of thing. You speak up a wee bit. I'm struggling. Sorry, like, so how do you work that out? Like, how much it's going to cost, or how long it's going to take? If it's something like that that you don't know for sure, like what's going to happen. It's going to cost about that much. All right. Okay. That's where your skill and your experience come in. So some things can be quantified. What happens if I need a 100 megabit connection instead of a 10 megabit connection? Well, it's on a bit of paper somewhere, and I'll say the cost of that is X. But what's the cost of the extra time taken to put that in? Are you sure how long it will take to get that put in? What the extra staff cost? Well, I think it will take about an extra 10 days, and I'm going to have to dedicate two people full time to that. So that's four days of work and so on and so on. So a lot of these things are about best guess. Where you can get a number, put it in. Where you can't, you have to use your skill, your experience, your previous knowledge of things to estimate. Yeah. Yeah. So they've gone through a whole pile of these things. They've tried to understand what the likelihood is, what it will cost. And written them down. If only so that when you come back, if anything does happen, you can go, yeah, we did plan for it. You had it here. You knew this was a risk when we went into this project and you approved it on that basis. And now this has come true and this is what it's going to cost. What's your problem? And a large part of that is about this. It's about saying, yeah, we thought about this and you approved it on that basis. If suddenly you come back after having a project approved three months down the line and say, ah, do you know something? We've spent all the money you gave us and it's going to be twice as much. Write me a check, please. How happy do you think people are going to be? And that's definitely a rhetorical question. So it's about understanding the risks. It's about letting everyone know what the risks are and understanding what the potentials are. Which is why I've got you to do it as part of your case study. You should be looking at that case study and thinking, what could go wrong here? What are the potential issues? What might happen if they happen? And how likely is it that it will? And you're going to have to go and create a risk register. It's part of the marketing scheme for your submission. And from memory, it's quite a high part. It's about 10% of it. So I'm expecting it to be complete and I'm expecting it to be well researched and well understood. It's up to you what format you use. I've shown you three different formats just in the last 10 minutes, and I actually don't really mind, but it needs to get across all of the information. If you pushed me, I think I prefer that type because it has everything in one place rather than having to go to one place to see the risk and another place to see the control. Here it's all in one place, so I quite like that layout, but it's up to you. The important thing is you have to do everything that's on that slide. Figure out what the risks are, figure out what the consequences uh, is it, is it, are. Pardon? Is it, is it possible to go back in the previous slide, please? Previous slide, did you say? Yeah, where you show the risk stuff. This one? Yes. Well, the one you say you prefer. Oh, that wasn't a slide. That's uh, a link. So it's a link from Moodle. So I've given you some risk registers, some examples from uh, okay. North Ayrshire, two from North Ayrshire, one for an integrated joint board, one for South Ayrshire. This one happens to be North Ayrshire. I quite like that layout. I think it's clear. OK.
and weirdly this one is about cyber security. What were the chances of that happening, eh? So what happens if the council loses data? What happens if there's a breach and sensitive data or personal data is taken? What happens if money goes? About 10 years ago, this particular council lost quite a lot of money. Anyone care to, does anyone remember or want to guess at how they managed to lose money? I'm not sure if I remember it on that. Uh, it was incredibly sophisticated. Remarkably sophisticated hack into the uh, council account systems. Wow. What they did was somebody phoned up the accounts department and said, we have changed our bank details. When you're paying us, can you use this sort code and this account number? And someone at the other side of the phone went, sure, no problem. They changed the details on the system and everything that was supposed to be paid to that company was paid to this scam artist who immediately withdrew the money and ran away. How lucky they are. How would you have put in place controls to stop that happening? You put in place various authorization processes, especially on things which are very sensitive like that. Right. Why is one person whose job it is to answer the phone also got the ability to change account information without someone else looking at it? Should they have that authority? Well, in this case, clearly not. No, not just one person. Not just one person. That's a big part of it. Check and counter check. So there are issues. There are issues with new legislation about GDPR. What happens if that stuff gets lost? What happens if there's a successful cyber attack? So what they're doing about it, they've put a new team together to look at all this stuff. They are securing laptops and putting data encryption in place. They're recognising that it can't be 100% secure. But they'll keep looking at it. What's the likelihood? Don't know, somewhere in the middle. The impact could be quite large, but it steals all personal data. So it's a three times four, it's a 12. So you're going to have to think about it in detail. Think about it in the context, not just of that organization, but all the surrounding stuff as well. Excuse me, the surrounding legislation. This particular one isn't just about the organization, it's about the fact that GDPR has come in and that GDPR is an issue and that there's going to have to be a response. So it's a risk in terms of the compliance because they have to comply to the legislation. There are other things in there about reputational risk if you lose uh, sensitive data and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, it's not just about the words that you read. It's not just about what the people in the organisation tell you. It's not just about what they think the issues are. It's about you understanding this wider area, which is why there's all that stuff in Moodle. And I'm surprised, and I've forgotten who asked the question, but I'm surprised that you haven't actually looked at this before we came into the lecture. I would absolutely encourage you to do that from now on. Okay. It's about all of this stuff. And you remember right at the start, I said, all these things here, 
we're actually not going to cover, but they're important because they should under it helps you understand the wider perspective of how these things are working and the legislative framework in which they take place. We're not covering them because we would cover these at a lower level. So I'm kind of assuming that you've done these things before, but if you haven't, we don't have time to cover them in this class. So you'll need to make sure that you understand all the ethics and computer misuse and GDPR and all the rest of the stuff. That's why there's a hash against it. You absolutely have to know this stuff. Happy to answer questions about it, but you need to go and check it out yourself. So that one was a risk register in response to other things. GDPR. So it's about understanding the organisation. It's about understanding what they do and what might go wrong, but it's also about understanding the wider framework in which they find themselves. That's why you're paid the big bucks. Oh, Darth Vader's joined us. OK, so you have to do all of that with all of your risks. And I expect to see a comprehensive risk report. I expect you to have thought about everything. Any questions on that just now? Nope. 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 One of the reasons Somebody asked last week why we were doing all this, why we weren't just doing cyber. This is part of cyber. This is part of the sorts of stuff <laughs> that people are looking for. So I've just done that quick search for GRC jobs. <laughs> Sorry? No, 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 sorry, it's not you. I was, uh, my microphone is not, sorry. So here, for example, is someone who knows about GRC is paid 60 to 70,000 a year. Here's a cyber security manager. But the reason that GRC is in there is because. I don't know how to. Is because they'll have mentioned it in the things that they know want you to know about. Certainly hope they have because I haven't actually checked this. It's going to be quite a big commute. Probably cost me about 30 grand a year to get in there. <laughs> yeah. The ideal candidate in Richmond will be a strong security GRC analyst. But the job title is Cyber Security Manager. So I know someone brought this up last week. This is why. This is what companies want. And yes, you're right. It is a London one. Unusually, I haven't seen one in, in Glasgow at the moment. But you'll just have to believe me when I tell you that they do exist. Oh. Um, Probably because most big companies keep their good jobs down south. Yeah, well, that's part of it. I simply took London because it was top of the list. Oh, there you go. You don't even have to go to London. It's remote working. It's a cyber GRC practitioner. 50 to 60. I'll apply cyber. for that one tonight. Mm. Cloud security architect, GRC required. 
an information security analyst, GRC required, a cyber security engineer, GRC required. This Tony, is why we're doing it. See, like, see when we come out of uni, right, and let's say we all pass and we'll get, like, you know, strong passes and stuff. I mean, we can't expect to be going for their kind of jobs right away, can we? Or No, like, not straight out of university. Well, what le not. Even with a master's, what level like could I expect, do you think? If I went, right, I've got a master's degree in this. Um, so what would be the, the kind of entry job? Type? Would it just be a general cyber security engineer? Or? Uh, Sean would be a better person to ask that of. Mm -hmm. um, cyber security is not my primary area so I'm, I'm not really i'm not really sure what there is at the moment aye but following on from that most people don't people don't start at the top you work your way up so knowing about this stuff means that you get involved with this stuff means that you become you, you add the stuff to your cv so yes this isn't first out of university job yeah but mm -hmm. it's second or third out of university job once you build up your experience and show that you can do it. Mm -hmm. But if you're wandering into it and they go, can you help us with a risk register? And you go, what? <laughs> That's not going to help your long term job prospects. Mm. So I don't know, ask Sean, he's, he keeps a he keeps his finger in the pulse clearly because it's it's his program. I, I don't know offhand what um, what's around just now, but definitely talk to Sean about it. Mm -hmm. Hey, having seen that, any other questions just now? Um, no, not for me. Okay, so nope. between now and next week, here's the tutorial, and it's exactly what you would expect it to be. Start thinking about potential risks, particularly how it addresses mm. IT or cyber in your case, and start to think about where the issues might be. So I don't mind if you start in your area. Later on, we'll broaden it out to everything else. So this is just starting in the stuff that you know about, the IT stuff. We have at least two minutes left for you to do this in your tutorial. So I'm sure you'll have it finished by, you know, one o'clock. If not, have a think about it over the week. Start working about it over the week. Start working on it over the week and start thinking how you would create your risk register in those terms. Any questions on that and what it is you're needing to do? No. No, thank you. Yep. OK. What I am going to do then is just in case all these people are being quiet because they didn't want to be recorded, I will stop the recording now.